Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Mob Museum. Uh, my name is Jeff Schumacher, Vice President of Exhibits and Programs here at the museum. Uh, tonight, we are embarking on the first of two programs marking the 90th anniversary of legal gambling in Nevada. The second program will be on March 25th and will feature talks by David Schwartz and Ellen Feldman. So we've got four people talking about you know, four distinct parts of this history. Uh, we start tonight with a familiar face to many of you, Michael Green. Among other things, Mike is a history professor at UNLV, and he's a Mob Museum board member. More generally, I think we can say that Mike is perhaps the most, promi the most prominent voice in our community when it comes to the history and character of Las Vegas. We're really lucky to have someone like that in our community. Uh, Mike is going to talk about the legalization of gambling in Nevada and the early years of casino development in Las Vegas, especially along Fremont Street. After Mike has completed his presentation, then I will talk for a while about the rise of the Las Vegas Strip, focusing on uh, 1940 to 1960, roughly. So between the two of us, we'll cover from 1931 to 1960. Then afterward, both of us will address any questions or comments you might have uh, you know, on this or any other topic, really. Um, just a quick reminder to please silence your cell phones and uh, appreciate that. Okay, so with that, please join me in welcoming Michael Green. It works. Okay. I, I'm not used to people anymore. Uh, actually, as a professor, I'm one of those who really hasn't noticed. We don't go out anyway. But it, it's good to be out, it's good to have you here, and it's good to be able to uh, commemorate, talk about uh, the origins of casino gambling here and trace its evolution, at least in the downtown area mainly, in the 30s and 40s. And then, as he said, Jeff will talk about uh, the Strip. He gets the more fun stuff, obviously. Uh, downtown's fun, but, you know, I get one allusion to the mob. He, he gets a lot. So with that, yes, the 30s and 40s, pre-canopy, you might say. So this was the Review Journal on March 17th, 1931, and I love the fact that the fact that the state senate has approved casino gambling is not the top headline. It's the local hospitals that they're planning, one of which was the old Las Vegas hospital at 8th and Ogden, which uh, some of you who are long timers here may have spent some time at, as I did, uh, where my pediatrician was. And uh, they were also talking about the county hospital. Now, two days later, you really have to look for it. And I want to see if there it is. There or there. Uh, now, I think the fact that the RJ's editor was Democratic and the governor was Republican probably had nothing to do with that story placement. <laughs> But, in fact, it does convey what was true, really, for Las Vegans and for most Nevadans. They did not see this as the revolutionary event it has come to be. In fact, there had been legal gambling in Nevada from 1869 until 1910. Then in 1915, they pulled back a little bit, and they allowed a little bit of legal gambling, but very little, and, of course, nothing illegal went on. Right. So by this time, there had been discussion of it for a few years. And at the time it became legal, it was sort of the orphan in the sense of not having anyone really claiming credit for it. The fact is that later a legislator from Winnemucca, a rancher named Phil Tobin, said, well, I decided to introduce it. I decided to do this. And it was really a cover story. The political boss of the state, George Wingfield, had supported it, but 
Wingfield was one of those people, he was kind of like a bull who carried his own china shop with him. If he was involved, it was going to be controversial. So better for Wingfield to be quiet. Then in turn, there was a real estate developer here in Las Vegas named Tom Carroll, who saw this as a way to attract investment. A tourist comes here, spends a few days, says, whoa, this place is developing. I've got to get in on the action. I'm going to stay here and invest. And if not, we took a little money from them. And of course, now we don't really expect people who come here to visit to say, oh, we're going to stay here, though judging by the population, most of them do. I think at the moment they're all in the spaghetti bowl. So March 19th, 1931 was the day that the legislature and the governor agreed gambling becomes legal. It's also the day that the governor at the time, Fred Balzar, signed a bill to have six-week divorces. That was bigger in Reno. It became bigger in Las Vegas before too long. And then when the state made marriages easier to get, no blood test, having the county building open 24 hours to be able to get a marriage license, that became another big money maker. But at the time, you know, come for six weeks, you'll stay forever, or so they hoped. Well, that's Fremont Street, and in fact, you're looking toward second. If you're a longtime Las Vegas, you say second. If you are a newcomer, you say Casino Center. It's how we figured it out. And the Hotel Apache may look a little familiar today. The sign on it says Binions though there is an, a Hotel Apache still there. Uh, that building was built by a pioneer Italian family here, the Sylvanies, and one of the, defendant, the descendants of the Sylvanies is still involved, and she is sort of recording the family's history. But the first licensed club was the Northern Club. And it's going to begin a little trend because every Old West town had a Northern Saloon. And we're going to pick up on this Old West idea as we go. The licensee in the lower left is the very regal and stern-looking lady, Mamie Stocker. They're actually dressed for Heldorado. You can see the Heldorado sign. That starts a couple of years later. And many of you are familiar with Heldorado, the Old West parade, rodeo, and so on. Now, she may have been the first front person in the history of Las Vegas. There's a belief that actually her husband and sons were the real operators of the Northern Club, but they worked for the railroad, and the railroad did not like the idea of its workers being licensed to have a gambling house. So her name is on it. Well, eventually, the Northern Club went into other hands, most notably Wilbur Clark, who I believe Mr. Schumacher will get to. He ends up owning or being an owner of the Desert Inn. But he changed the name to the Monte Carlo. And I kind of like the idea of Monte Carlo, the big gambling center, and Las Vegas trying to promote itself as the American equivalent of Monte Carlo. By the way, that stuff on the street, yes, Virginia, there is snow. It does happen. OK. Where was the Northern Club? What happened to the building? Anybody want to shout an answer? It was taken out, and it's where the Golden Gate expanded down Fremont. And the Golden Gate is the oldest hotel, originally the Hotel Nevada, opened in 1906 by John Miller, later the Sal Sagev and eventually the Golden Gate when a group of San Francisco folks came in. That was your first shot at trivia for the night. You're going to get several. We, we, will, we will make you respond. There will be a quiz. One of the major spots on Fremont Street was the Boulder Club. And notice, enjoy the Old West. Again, Western. The guy who operated it, the main owner, was named Prosper Gumond. And I don't know about you, if I go to a casino and the guy who owns it is named Prosper, <laughs> I'm nervous. 
Now, the interior of the Boulder Club, it, it's busy, great. Notice, slot machines way over to the side. In those days, slot machines were not money makers. The pit was what you looked to to make the money. But it was a small place. This is the casino, and here's the bar. Now, Gumond was involved in the community, and eventually the house he lived in was moved to the county museum in Henderson, part of Heritage Street, uh, where you sometimes find Mark Hall Patton hiding from Pawn Stars. Gumond also bought a hunk of land and turned it into a divorce ranch where his daughter Margot gave horseback riding lessons. And today, part of it is a national monument. It's Thule Springs, where I first rode a horse as a kid. The horse, by the way, was named Gladys Crunchbottom. We didn't get too far. <laughs> but it's worth remembering that the guys who got involved here in the 30s often were involved in several different businesses and in each other's clubs. And that was true of Gumond, who invested with others and vice versa. One of the people he invested with was J. Kell Housel Sr., who's sitting at the desk there. Mr. Housel's came here from Pismo Beach, but he started out in Ely as a mining engineer, and he's there with his son who said his father figured out he was doing better if he got on the other side of the table. Which brings to mind a casino owner who said, if you want to make money in a casino, own it. And Kel Housel's figured that out. Well, in 1930, before gambling's technically legal, he opens the Las Vegas Club, which was not at the location at Maine and Fremont, where the building was blown up to make room for the new circa. It was actually down the block a little bit on Fremont. Housels also bought a house built by Harley A. Harmon, who was the district attorney at one time, and the Housels house is now a building at UNLV. It was one of the first buildings in town that they moved somewhere else to preserve it, and it's still used on campus today. Now, Kel Jr. there, I, I got to interview him a lot, so I like to talk about him. He went to West Point and then to law school, and he was bored to tears with practicing law, and as his father got older, he had him do some legal work for him, and then he gradually got involved in the business as well. In fact, the Housels were involved in a few things. Kel Housels eventually bought the El Cortez. His son had his law office there at one point. He was involved in operating the showboat. And after he died, his son was running the company and eventually sold it to Harrah's, now Caesars Entertainment. There was a story that they're about to build a big uh, apartment complex, mixed-use development, where the showboat used to be. My dad was a dealer there for 20 years and at the Stardust for about 10 years, and he said once he thought there was a conspiracy to blow up every place he had worked. <laughs> now, Housel's got into other things. The Roundup Drive-In with Bob Baskin, who was a longtime local politician and restaurant operator. And there's a Bob Baskin Park you may have seen. Speaking of parks, John Miller, who had had the Golden Gate, had a ranch. Housel's bought it, and then they worked out a deal with the county, and it became Sunset Park. So again, these guys were investing with each other. Housel's had a piece of the Boulder Club. Gumond had a piece of the Las Vegas Club. And they were doing other businesses and doing other things in the community. In fact, uh, the Housel's family helped create some other things. Anything come to mind? So Kel Jr. married Nancy, who was a dancer, and they started the Nevada Ballet Theater. And Nancy Housels was instrumental in helping to start the Smith Center. And we all look forward to going back there, too. By the way, you saw the entirety of my dancing ability. <laughs> now, the Hotel Apache, the Sylvanies did not generally try to run the casino and they would bring in other people. And at one point, Tony Cornero was going to come in and run something called the SS Rex. And Cornero's story is kind of interesting in that he was a kind of mobster, 
certainly organized crime, things like bootlegging and prostitution in California. And while he was, as they like to say, away at college, his brothers opened the Meadows Club, which was the first carpet joint after gambling became legal, a nightclub with some lounge acts, and it was supposed to be a cut above. Tony eventually came and was involved in running it. It was located where Boulder Highway and Fremont are sort of the same, where the one turns into the other. I think now it's a Lowe's, it used to be Montgomery Ward. And it eventually burned, and there is a rumor that uh, the city and county volunteer fire department showed up to try to put out the fire, got in a fight over who'd get to put it out, and while they were fighting, it burned down. Uh, there's also a version that the Corneros burned it down for the insurance money. But at any rate, Tony was here in the early 30s for a spell and decided eventually to go back to California and run a gambling cruise ship. And the SS Rex was the name of it, and thus when he was going to have the casino in the Hotel Apache, it was the SS Rex. And you'll notice it says uh, that it go, you go out three miles or whatever outside the three mile limit anchored off Santa Monica. The idea was that once you got in international waters, you were free to gamble. If the state of California prohibited gambling, and it did, then you could start once you were outside those boundaries, sort of like the idea of the ship's captain performing weddings and so on and so forth. And Cornero, well, he was on the SS Rex and he got in some trouble and he left, came back here for a while, and you'll meet him again when Jeff's talking about him. But uh, this, this is high-grade trivia because there was a movie based on the life of Tony Cornero Mr. Lucky and his character was Cary Grant. You'll notice the resemblance between the two of them. Uh, to make the story better, the co-star was Lorraine Day, who later was married to Leo DeRocher, the baseball manager, who was suspended from baseball for a year for hanging out with some questionable folks, including our friend Mr. Siegel. So there are all kinds of odd little connections here. By the way, Gladys Cooper was uh, later in My Fair Lady as the maid. So Kevin Bacon was not in it. <laughs> I, I chose the only movie Hollywood's ever made without Kevin Bacon in it. Now, the problem for Cornero was that his ship was shut down in, around 1938-39 when the elections in California led to a pair of, well, maybe reformers, maybe not. The one on the left was the state attorney general, Earl Warren, who shut down the cruise ships. And that drove out some people who said, all right, I can't run illegal gambling now in California. Where do I go? Well, since they were in Southern California, it made sense to get on Highway 91 and head up. So most of them did. The guy on the right, Fletcher Bowron, was elected mayor of Los Angeles in 1938, and I put the question mark after reformers because I was doing a talk once and referred to him as a reformer, and a little old lady came up and said he wasn't closing casinos because he opposed them, he was closing them because he owned the competition. Well, I don't know, so I'll, I'll be careful. But again, you're a Los Angeles casino operator, where are you going to go? Reno's too far, except for Bill Harrah. He took off for Reno. Everybody else headed here. For example, that guy, Sam Boyd Stadium. Uh, I, that's a terrible thing to say about him. I'm not a big fan of the stadium. Uh, Sam Boyd was one of the major figures in the gaming industry here. He came here working at the El Rancho Vegas, worked his way into management, ultimately became the general manager of the Mint downtown when it opened, went into ownership, and as with Kel Housels, he sent his son to law school. And then the son went in the business with him. And Bill Boyd is still involved with Boyd Gaming after all these years. The first hotel they were really involved in together downtown was the Union Plaza. The next one was the California. Then they go on to build Samstown and several others. And when, and this will be covered, I think, by David Schwartz in two weeks, when the Stardust mobsters were cleared out finally, Boyd was brought in to run that hotel and the other one they owned, the Fremont. So the Boyds wound up back downtown. 
Marion Hicks ran a cruise ship off the California coast. He came up here and he built the El Cortez. And of course, if you go to 6th and Fremont, you can even see some of the old building. Not necessarily the cars. Uh, they may have tickets for being parked for 70 years. But that was really the first, I think, resort style hotel in the downtown area. Hicks later went out to the Strip as well. And he ended up quite often selling his properties or having partners with interesting reputations. So he had sold the El Cortez, and these are some of the owners. Uh, Mr. Siegel on the far left was involved. Then you have Mo Sedway and Gus Greenbaum. And then, of course, uh, the real boss, Meyer Lansky. So there was some mob involvement there, we know that. And today, of course, you have the El Cortez commemorating that. It's part of their history, and uh, they talk about it a good bit. Guy McAfee was an L.A. Sheriff's Department vice cop who left the police to run illegal casinos. And his wife there allegedly was the madam of the local brothels. And he was run out by Bowron, came up here, and opened that place in 1946, the Golden Nugget. Again, note the Western name, like El Cortez as well. And uh, since then, it's expanded slightly. Some friends came up here with him. And they ended up opening the Pioneer Club. Now, a couple of them, uh, one was uh, Farmer Page, and he also would eventually buy out the Boulder Club from Mr. Gumont. And another one was Tutor Shearer, who became known as the Poet Laureate of Las Vegas because, well, he was named it officially, but he wrote poetry. He also managed in his 70s, I believe, to marry a 20-year-old beauty queen who shot him one day, uh, reputedly, uh, when she caught him doing something he shouldn't have been doing. Uh, but he also got interested in uh, some land out on a little-known street now called Bond Avenue. And Bond is now Tropicana. Well, they were involved in the Pioneer Club, and that brings us to this pair down here. On the right, Cliff Jones. Cliff Jones and his brother Herb and their sister Florence Lee moved here from Missouri in the 30s. Florence Lee became a reporter for the Review Journal, a longtime historian and editor, and Cliff and Herb practiced law together. And Cliff's nickname was Big Juice. He was well-connected. He knew what he was doing. And he figured out early in life as a lawyer that you might do better as a lawyer getting a piece of the property you're representing than just getting a fee. Uh, Bill Boyd once said that he represented someone from the womb to the tomb. And in the process, you get a piece of the action. And so Cliff Jones managed to end up involved in some operations here. Uh, there was also the case, uh, he had a case before a local judge, George Marshall, and a lawyer ran in and said, hey, I have an option to buy the Boulder Dam Hotel. Uh, it's $50,000, I have 12.5, you guys want in. So Jones, the other attorney, and the judge all agreed they each wanted a piece of it. And they said, but we have a case. The judge said, I declare a recess till tomorrow morning. And they took off and bought the hotel. So there was a lot of interesting investing going on. And in 1946, Cliff Jones was elected to statewide office lieutenant governor. And in that position, he got to meet a visiting fellow Democratic politician to Las Vegas in 1950. Uh, that guy may look a little bit familiar, since you saw him walking in. Uh, where is he? Hmm, where is, where is he standing in that photo? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, I think I may be Estes Kefauver. Howdy, y'all. He was from Tennessee. I should have a coonskin cap. Well, of course, the Kefauver hearings were held in this room in 1950 and in 13 other cities across the country. Now, by that time, yes, we had the strip, but 
Some of the people he talked to were involved in downtown as well. Bill Moore, who had the Hotel Last Frontier, was also involved in the El Cortez. Cliff Jones spoke before them. He was with the Pioneer Club. And uh, among other things, Kefauver could not believe that Bill Moore was on the commission that regulated the casino industry when he owned a casino. But of course, that goes back to the story of where allegedly Lansky said, you know, you, you do all these things you're crusading against. Uh, why don't you leave us alone? And Kefauver said, I just don't want you running it. Well, they were here for the day in November 1950. So the spot may look familiar. This building was erected in 33, part of the downtown community, not necessarily associated with gambling. In fact, the federal government would have preferred that there be no gambling within about 1,000 miles of the building, but uh, they kind of had to put up with it since it was Las Vegas. We also see in this period the beginnings of gaming regulation, and these will come up again as we go through the four speakers overall. When gambling became legal in 1931, there were people who said, oh, it's better to regulate a vice, that's why we're doing it. The state had nothing to do with regulating gambling when it became legal. The state's role was to accept a quarter of the revenue. It was up to the cities and counties to regulate the industry. And this understandably leads to a problem because it's very local. These are very small groups trying to do the regulating. They don't have the ability to dig as deeply as we would have liked them to do. Well, in 1945, a group of state legislators introduced, get ready, it's a good thing you're all sitting down for this, a tax increase. They wanted to raise taxes. They wanted to impose a quarter cent tax on gambling. And the governor at the time was an Elko attorney named E.P. Carville. And he opposed it on the grounds that taxation without representation allegedly caused the revolution. And if you're taxed, you should demand representation. The casinos had no business with the state, better to keep them out of it. Well, of course, they go ahead with the tax, and the gaming industry has become a major political player throughout the state as a result. But the state also set up regulation with licensing at the same time with the Tax Commission, which was run by Robbins Cahill, who in turn did the investigating, did the regulating, and was kind of a one-man band. This continued through the governorships of Vale Pittman, a Democrat who took over from Carville in 45, and then a Republican, Charles Russell, who was elected in 1950. And Russell would ultimately be the governor who pushed through the creation of the Gaming Control Board, which is still the main investigative arm of the industry today. And Bill Moore was running the El Cortez, and until the creation of the Control Board, was still on the board regulating his own industry which is a nice bit of work if you can get it. What we see by 1950 is incredible growth in Las Vegas. The population when gambling became legal was about 5,100. By 1950, the population of Las Vegas itself is around 25,000. It will be 65,000 by 1960. The area is going to take off thanks mainly to gambling, with some help from the federal government. The help is kind of ironic. By cracking down on gambling across the country, Kefauver helped inspire a lot of people to move here. They could move here and do it legally. But it's also the case that the federal government, with places like Nellis Air Force Base and the atomic test site, would enhance our economy and population as well. And in 50, when Kefauver came here, the next largest city he visited was Tampa. And its population was 100,000 more. Las Vegas had already made its name. Jeff Schumacher is going to talk to you about some of the other ways in which it made its name. And since Jeff was being nice to me, I would be nice to him anyway. But Jeff 
was a wonderful newspaperman who has become a wonderful museum executive and all along the way has written terrific history, including what I think is the best one-volume book on Las Vegas, Sun, Sin, and Suburbia, and a book on Howard Hughes. He also edited our 150th anniversary sesquicentennial book, uh, which is a beautiful book, which uh, I must say holds down part of our carpeting. Uh, it's big. It's coffee table. And I encourage you to look for his books because they're great. So it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce Jeff Schumacher and less pleasure to put my masks on. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Mike. That was, that was outstanding and impossible to follow, of course. I set myself up for failure here. So um, I apologize in advance for this. Um, I have a lot of ground to cover uh, over the next 30 minutes, so I want to apologize not, for not being able to address everything that happened on this trip over a 20-year period. Um, this will be a little bit like uh, speed dating with history. That's how this is going to go. But I want to I want to hit as many uh, many of the highlights as as we can. I want to start with 1940 to make the point that Las Vegas was still a very small town in 1940. Uh, this is very clear from if you read issues of the Las Vegas Evening Review Journal because it came out in the afternoon in those days. Uh, from 1940, you will see that it was almost all small town news. Uh, you know, with the exception of the occasional uh, uh, high profile wedding, uh, we a lot of people were coming here to get married, get divorced, uh, but it was maybe once a month there would be that kind of a news story. Um, and of course the annual Hell Dorado, which Mike mentioned, that was always a big deal. That was about it. There might have been the occasional uh, drunken driver who caused havoc or something like that, but it was, it was a very small town. And I think uh, it did have a bit of a reputation, though. Already by 1940, Las Vegas was a bit of a sin city, or at least the reputation for it was. Now, this column, uh, written by, uh, uh, we'll get to that in a second, but it was called Caught on the Run. And I just thought this was so funny, the way he put this. Um, he says, a, a party of six came to Las Vegas from Ogden, Utah last weekend to see, as they put it, the wild and woolly Las Vegas. Uh, that they had heard so much about. Following a day and night in this town, they reported that Las Vegas was the, quote, nicest, cleanest town they had ever been in, and they were surprised to see no drunks and no fighting on the streets. They like Las Vegas so much, they are coming here again for a longer stay. Um, so I'm not sure if we had yet reached the, uh, the debauchery that we became known for in 1940. Um, anyway, things started changing fast uh, the following year. Uh, that was the year, 80 years ago, by the way, that saw the transformation of Las Vegas from a town to a city, uh, from a regional curiosity to an international resort destination. And there were three major developments that kicked off this unprecedented growth boom that Mike referred to. Uh, there was the Las Vegas Army Airfield. Uh, the United States, of course, did not formally joined the fight against the Axis powers until after Pearl Harbor. But America contributed money and materials to the Allies as early as 1940, and perhaps before, and figuring it was just a matter of time before we, came, we became directly involved, the military started getting ready. In October 1940, Army Air Corps officials scouted several southwestern states and desert locations for an aerial gunnery school. Las Vegas was selected, ultimately, because it offered three things. Large, uninhabited areas north of town, uh, the ability to train year-round because of our weather, and an inland location uh, that reduced the likelihood of an enemy attack. So it had all the elements that they wanted, mostly the wide-open spaces. 
The Army began construction in March of 1941. The first commanding officer had his first office in the basement of this building. That's where it started. From this temporary base of operations, uh, Martin Stenseth and his junior officers designed the gunnery school curriculum. Since the base had to be constructed from scratch, we're out here in the desert, there's no military operation, it was a massive endeavor. Besides the runways, crews built 173 buildings and installed electrical lines, sewer lines, water systems, and all the technical equipment needed to, uh, for a cutting edge military operation. By July of 1941, more than 800 enlisted men were stationed at the base, moving into the newly constructed barracks and helping to build other structures. After Pearl Harbor, the airfield expanded dramatically. In 1942, its first full year in operation, the airfield graduated more than 9,000 gunners. So this is a, these numbers are just unprecedented for Las Vegas. Uh, this is a period of, of unbelievable growth here. At its peak in 1943 and 44, the airfield hosted more than 15,000 enlisted men and women, and notably, all of whom spent money in area stores, restaurants, casinos, bars. I mean, they, they were, there was a lot of money in town, and there were a lot of people. And it also was a real housing crunch uh, because of that. And that was only part of the story. While the Army airfield, airfield sprouted northeast of Las Vegas, Another war-related project was gearing up to the southeast. Basic Magnesium Incorporated was created to produce magnesium, uh, a lightweight metal that it was incorporated into the structure of aircraft. It would increase the speed and maneuverability of the aircraft. It was quite a, an important piece for us in World War II. Magnesium was also used in bombs, flares, and tracer bullets. Um, the man behind the magnesium plan, his name was Howard Ells. He was from Cleveland. In 1936, he discovered a rich magnesite deposits in northern Nye County near the current town of Gabs. Um, if you've been to Gabs, raise your hand. Uh, uh, look at, let's see, raise your hand. Excellent. Two. Well, it didn't exist when he discovered the, uh, the magnesite there, uh, the town, I mean. He originally wanted the magnesite to produce furnace bricks. That was the idea. But as the war raged in Europe, he recognized the value of his discovery to the American military. So Ells partnered uh, with a British company to build the plant. The US government invested $130 million in the project. So they talk about the federal assistance that, that Mike referred to, that's an example. And Ells decided to build uh, his plant about 20 miles southeast of Las Vegas. You might say, well, why, why did he build it there? Well, it was close to Hoover Dam, which provided abundant water and electricity, but it was also not too far from Las Vegas, which had the railroad. He needed all of these, all of this infrastructure in order to do what he wanted to do. Construction started in September of 1941, and by December, more than 2,700 men were working there. The numbers then soared from there. By 1942, there were 13,000 people working in what is now Henderson. And again, housing crunch. But also, all kinds of money on the weekends going into these downtown casinos and, uh, and eventually casinos out on the highway, which we'll get to next. The third big piece that happened in 1941 was the opening of the El Rancho Vegas on April 3rd, 1941. It was the first hotel casino on what eventually came to be called the Las Vegas Strip. It was Western themed, if reflecting what Mike was saying about this theme that was so, uh, so prominent at the time. It debuted, it had 50 hotel rooms when it opened, that was a lot. It had restaurants, a theater, a casino, and a swimming pool. Nice place. Now, according to legend, popular legend, a lot of people believe this to be true, uh, it was, the El Rancho Vegas, this is true, El Rancho Vegas was built by Tommy Hall. But this, the legend behind why he built the El Rancho Vegas goes that he and a friend were driving on high, Highway 91 uh, toward Los Angeles uh, when their car got a flat tire just south of the city limits. So probably about where the Sahara is now or maybe a little further. While the friend hitchhiked back to town to seek assistance, Hull waited beside the highway and he counted the cars going by. After an hour of this, he became convinced uh, that he had found a great place to build a hotel. So that's a clever origin story. 
however, uh, it bears really little resemblance to what really happened. Um, in fact, Hall expressed interest in building a Las Vegas hotel as early as 1938. Las Vegas business leaders Robert Griffith and Big Jim Cashman, whose family still contributes to the community today, still in the community, encouraged Hull to make the investment. They really pushed hard. They wanted a big hotel here, and he agreed uh, to build it. However, uh, Hull did not uh, uh, secure financing for the venture until 1940. So it, it's not, coincident, not a coincidence, I think, that Las Vegas was starting, you know, people were seeing, the invest, you know, the banks and so forth were seeing this potential in Las Vegas. There's going to be an Army airfield. There's going to be a magnesium plant. There's other things going on with Hoover Dam visitation is growing every year. And so as soon as those, those news items started appearing, that's when Tommy Hall was able to, to get the, the money that he needed to build the El Rancho Vegas. Just a quick note, Hull chose not to build uh, this place within the city limits, which certainly wasn't uh, pleasing to the city fathers. But uh, he bought an affordable parcel on Highway 91, south of what, what then was called San Francisco Street, which is now Sahara Avenue, just outside the city boundary. And, you know, there he was not subject to, you know, uh, city taxes, city regulation, or maybe city corruption. He didn't want any part of any of that, so he was out in the county. Another quote I wanted to share. So in 1942, a writer for the Saturday Evening Post showed up in Las Vegas. He'd heard about all this hubbub, you know, that we've just been discussing. And he wrote an article about what was happening here. And, and one of his comments about the El Rancho Vegas, I think it was very, very uh, telling. He said, the rancho somehow has managed to make the riveter, the carpenter, and the truck driver at home in, at home in overalls in the same rooms with men and women in smart sport clothes. This is the key. No resort is likely to succeed in Vegas that doesn't accomplish this democracy. I think this is true. And I think this is something we have seen over the years that you know, Las Vegas accepts everybody. Everybody can come. There's no you know, snubbing your nose at anybody who walks in the door. And I think that's something that he picked up in 1942. So that's pretty interesting. Now, that article uh, was called Nevada's New Reno, which I find also fascinating because uh, the, the reputation of Las Vegas at the time was way below Reno. Reno was the big place in Nevada. Uh, but Las Vegas was coming on fast, and it became, in this, in this writer's eyes, Nevada's new Reno. It's the new big one on the, on the docket. And so he says, there are bigger war booms than Vegas's, but not relatively, nor any other is gaudy. There's never been anything quite like it, and there may never be again. The population is more than doubled, exclusive of the two army camps. Remember, there's also an army camp in Boulder City, so that's what he's referring to. For the first time in Nevada, Reno and Washoe County have been shoved back into second place. So if you're looking for a turning point between Reno and Las Vegas, this might, this might mark it in 1942. The second casino resort on Highway 91 was the Last Frontier, built by R.E. Griffith and his architect nephew Bill Moore, whom Mike referenced earlier. The Last Frontier opened on October 30th, 1942. The Last Frontier replaced the 91 Club, which had been operated by Guy McAfee, who Mike also met. And Mike mentioned that he opened the Golden Nugget. That was a few years later. When McAfee first came to town, he operated the 91 Club on the, what became the Strip. And uh, also McAfee, in some people's eyes, is the person who named the Strip. He came up with the idea uh, for, for calling it the Strip, based on the Sunset Strip in, in LA. Um, so, uh, but he was really one of the forerunners of what happened on the highway. Um, after Just a noteworthy, after a major renovation in 1955, the last frontier became the new frontier. Uh, a year later, a, a young upstart singer named Elvis Presley performed there. Um, the third resort on the Strip was the Flamingo, of course. We've talked about that many times at the Mob Museum. I won't be able to get into every facet of this story, but I'll touch on some of these. Uh, it opened on December 26, 1946, day after Christmas. Why? We'll save that for another day. One important way the Flamingo distinguished itself was it did not have a Western theme. I think that's a significant uh, a development that occurred at that time. Now, we have, when you talk about the Flamingo, you have to start 
with Billy Wilkerson. Um, the, the origins of the flamingo are no longer in dispute, really, but unfortunately, many people still buy into the myth. The original developer of the flamingo was not the short-tempered mobster Bugsy Siegel. It was Billy Wilkerson. He was a Los Angeles newspaper publisher and nightclub operator. Wilkerson's project started with the purchase of the, of the land on which the flamingo would eventually stand. In March of 1945, Wilkerson wrote a check for $9,500, this check right here, to a woman named Margaret Folsom, originally from Hawaii. This was a down payment for 33 acres on the east side of Highway 91. He paid Folsom a total of $84,000 for that property. Pretty good deal. I'm pleased to say, by the way, that the Mob Museum has acquired this original down payment check for its artifact collection. Uh, it was on temporary display during the holidays. Some of you might have seen it. Uh, it's not on display now, but it's going to go back up in June in a permanent new display that we're doing on the Flamingo. Very excited about that. All right, we have to touch on Bugsy Siegel. So Billy Wilkerson was, was building the Flamingo, getting started with it. But like happened many, many times in Las Vegas history, and we'll touch on a few more, he ran out of money. He was a, had a problem with gambling, Wilkerson, and he spent a lot of money down at the El Rancho Vegas and the Last Frontier losing it at the tables. That was one problem he had. And ultimately, he needed investors to help him finish the Flamingo. And ultimately, he turned to uh, basically the, a New York mob syndicate run by Meyer Lansky and, and Bugsy Siegel and some others. And uh, they in, agreed to invest uh, in the Flamingo. And you know, as the story goes, Lansky sent Siegel to Las Vegas. Siegel was actually familiar with Las Vegas from his move to Los Angeles in the 30s, and then he came and visited Las Vegas in the early 40s to uh, really take over the race wire here. He had some investments in downtown casinos, and uh, he, he wasn't unfamiliar with Las Vegas, but he had not done anything close to the Flamingo. Well, Lansky sends uh, Siegel to Las Vegas to oversee their investment. Now, of course, everybody's assuming that Wilkerson's still running this operation, but Siegel's there to, to check on things. Well, Siegel takes a real liking to this project, and he decides that he is going to run it himself. He, he wants the glory. He wants to have the control. He wants to, to in, put his imprint on the Flamingo. So over the next year, he starts really taking control. He's buying things. Uh, you know, he's, he's talking to contractors. He creates a company that is now going to be the company that uh, runs the Flamingo. And he essentially pushes Billy Wilkerson out of the way. And that brings me to this document. This legal document was signed by Bugsy Siegel on March 9th, 1947. Now, the, the Flamingo has been open for a couple of months by now. But he finally removes Wilkerson from any involvement with the Flamingo with this document. Siegel also paid Wilkerson $600,000 uh, to buy out his share of the project. So by March, by March of 1947, Wilkerson is completely separated from the Flamingo, and Siegel is the, is the lead man. Uh, by the way, this original document, also in the Mob Museum's collection, it's a recent acquisition. We're very excited to have it and it, too, will go on permanent display uh, in June. So, the, you know, this is such an important story to our museum that we are seeking out all these pertinent documents and other artifacts that, that help to tell this story. And so uh, this is a real jewel in that, in that uh, effort. We, and the story I'm not telling you is how Bugsy Siegel died and, and you know, all that stuff, and other people took over. Uh, we, we, most of you probably know that story. I've just got to keep, keep rolling along here to cover so much ground. Um, the fourth strip resort, the Thunderbird, opened in 1948. Now, there's a familiar face on the left, because Mike talked about him. It's Marion Hicks, who had previously built the El Cortez. Uh, and he uh, built the Thunderbird uh, with uh, Lieutenant Governor Cliff Jones, who Mike also mentioned. Now, the Thunderbird was a successful hotel casino for a number of years, 
but it ran into trouble with gaming authorities in the mid-1950s when the Las Vegas Sun newspaper exposed Meyer Lansky's hidden ownership. Lansky and his, his brother was basically working at the Thunderbird, and Meyer Lansky was a hidden, uh, hidden investor, hidden, making money from the Thunderbird, and this was discovered, exposed, and ultimately uh, they had to, uh, you know, d Marion Hicks was no longer involved with the operation. Now, this brings me to a trivia question. Mike and I agree we're going to have trivia questions. Hopefully people can answer them. Um, so the Thunderbird, this is a, one you might know. The Thunderbird's name changed in 1977. What did it change to? Silverbird. Correct. Now, uh, it was a Silverbird under the management of Major Riddle. And we'll talk about Major Riddle again. But from 1977 to 1981, uh, that's when Riddle died, and then it closed for a while, and then what was its next name? If you remember. It was the El Rancho, which has caused a great deal of confusion in the world ever since, because it was not the El Rancho Vegas, it was just the El Rancho. And uh, it, uh, it ended up going away uh, when, uh, and then they built another place in its, uh, in its place, the Fontainebleau, up on the north end of the Strip, which is now called the Drew, which will probably have another name by the time they finish it. But uh, that, that has not been the luckiest site in the world on the, on the Strip. Now, I want to wrap up the, uh, the 1940s uh, in two ways. Uh, first of all, McCarran Field opened for airline service in 1948. And I think this was just a real prime example of Las Vegas showing a forward-thinking mindset when it comes to tourism. And, you know, we, airplane, you know, travel was becoming more and more common, and Las Vegas needed to be a place that people could get to uh, and with major airlines. And so expanding McCarran uh, at that time made a lot of sense. And it was, of course, called McCarran because of Pat McCarran, who was instrumental in bringing funding uh, for the airport. Uh, we're now naming it something else, Harry Reid International Airport. There's a lot of reasons for that that we don't need to get into, but... McCarran, in any way, was, can, it's undisputed that he was in, instrumental in so many things that happened in this mid part of the century. And Mike could do three lectures on, on Pat McCarran. So I want to show you this very quickly. Mike referenced this, but this, I'm showing you this chart to illustrate just how dramatic the decade of the 40s was for Las Vegas. As you see here, the community grew by 194% between 1940 and 1950. We have never come close to that rate of growth since. You notice the, the 50s were a, a close second, but we've never approached that. When you think about the 1990s, if you were here, rapid, dramatic growth in the 90s pales in comparison to what happened in the 40s and 50s, just to give you the scale of you know, what we were dealing with at that time. So we move on to the 1950s with the opening of the Desert Inn. Desert Inn opens on April 24th, 1950, and it was competitive with the Flamingo from a luxury standpoint. It had some sort of, a little bit of Old West flavor, but mostly not. It was, it was trying to be more of a Palm Springs style uh, resort. Now, here's that face uh, we had earlier, Wilbur Clark. He started building the Desert Inn in 1947. This was his dream. This was like Bugsy Siegel had his dream, Wilbur and Billy Wilkerson had their dream of the Flamingo, Wilbur Clark had his dream for the Desert Inn. And if things had gone well for him, he could have opened it before the Thunderbird. Uh, uh, but he ran out of money. And when he did, uh, the skeleton of the resort sat idle for a couple of years. Really, there was, the construction stopped, and it, and it was just sitting there on the side of the, of the highway. Uh, but then a group of Cleveland investors got involved. And this is, you know, I'm sure Mo just loved this picture. But uh, uh, the Cleveland investors were led by a man named Mo Dalitz. Dalitz had been a bootlegger during Prohibition. Uh, then he ran illegal casinos in the Midwest. And he and, and his team essentially took over the Desert Inn, uh, but they kept Wilbur Clark as their front man. Now, Clark had a small investment in the, uh, in the Desert Inn, but uh, he was the front man. And he was a very good front man, by the way. I mean, people credited Wilbur Clark. He traveled all over this country promoting Las Vegas. He was the face of Las Vegas in many ways. He would be interviewed by newspaper reporters. He would be on television. Whatever it was, Wilbur Clark was talking up Las Vegas. He was very good at that. 
he just had, knew nothing about what was going on at the Desert Inn. <laughs> he had no connection to the finances. He didn't know anything that Mo Dalitz was doing, but he was doing his part. Briefly, I want to talk about a couple of places that people don't tend to talk about in these kind of talks, and one is the Silver Slipper. Now, the Silver Slipper opened in, night, in September of 1950 on the former site of the horse stables of the Last Frontier. The Last Frontier had horse stables, yes. Uh, it was essentially part of the Last Frontier Village theme park, because Last Frontier also had a theme park, and don't we wish we had some of those artifacts now? Uh, some people, there's a few, I think, at the State Museum, but there, there are not that many uh, that... Uh, we could enjoy today. It was like a museum, in, in a sense, of early Las Vegas. So uh, this is my trivia question number two. And you may or may not know this. When it, op when it first opened, the Silver Slipper had a different name. What was the different name of the Silver Slipper? Nobody. That's all right. It was called the Golden Slipper. The casino actually opened as the Golden Slipper Saloon and Gambling Hall. You can see that along the edge there of the, uh, of the roof. Uh, but the Golden Nuggets, Guy McAfee, objected to the Golden Slipper name. McAfee didn't want it to open at all. He felt like this was a copyright violation to use saloon, you know, Golden, and then Saloon and Gambling Hall. It was very similar to the Golden Nugget. Uh, but Bill Moore, uh, who was running it, uh, had already bought all kinds of branded materials that said Golden Slipper. He had plates, menus, postcards, uh, match, matchbooks, and other kinds of marketing materials that he had purchased. So uh, he, was, he wanted to keep it. Well, Art, uh, an attorney named Art Ham, Artemis Ham, uh, called Bill Moore on behalf of Guy McAfee and the Golden Nugget, and he said, you have to, you have to change the name. This is a violation. We have a right to this name. Uh, thought it was infringing on the Golden Nugget. Uh, well, Moore felt like he was on thin ice. I don't know if he was, felt he, like he was on legal thin ice or, or bodily injury thin ice, but he was definitely felt like he was on thin ice, so he agreed to change the name to Silver Slipper. But uh, Art Ham gave him three months to use the branded materials he had purchased and then stop using the name. So what ended up happening is the Golden Slipper existed for three months, and then in December of 1950, it became the Silver Slipper. And my thinking on this all along is, isn't Silver Slipper a better name anyway? It flows right off the tongue. Very quickly, I'm going to run through some casinos. The, the Sahara opened on October 7, 1952. Uh, its owner was Milton Prell, a businessman with interests in Los Angeles and, of all places, Butte, Montana. Um, and, and Prell, uh, I think there might be some people who might argue with me, but I suspect he may have been the only straight casino owner in Las Vegas at that time. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he might have had some unavoidable uh, associates, but for the most part, it's hard to pin him directly to anybody like a Meyer Lansky or a Mo Dalitz or anybody like that. Um, now, there's, there's Milton Prell. Last trivia question for me. So a casino operated on the Sahara site before the Sahara opened. What was it called? What was the casino there before it was the Sahara? OK. Here's the answer. Club Bingo. <laughs> and it was Melton Prowl who opened the Club Bingo in 1947, so before the Desert Inn. Um, across the street from the El Rancho Vegas, where the Sahara is now, had a 300-seat bingo parlor. That was like the main attraction of Club Bingo, thus the name. Uh, but it also offered all the other casino games as well. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a nice little place. It had a lot going on. Club Bingo also had live entertainment, uh, including singers, bands, and comedians, some at the t many of whom at the time were quite well known. Uh, probably the most famous person to perform there was Dorothy Dandridge, the, uh, uh, one of the most prominent entertainers at her time, and she performed at, at Club Bingo. Too bad that went away. Look at the, those bingo numbers up there. It's fun. The Sands opened on December 15, 1952, so after the Sahara. Interesting little connection. The Sands replaced the short-lived LaRue restaurant. Remember Billy Wilkerson? 
uh, the original builder of the Flamingo. We just talked about him. Well, he ended up returning to Las Vegas conveniently after Bugsy Siegel is no longer around, right? And he returned to Las Vegas in 1950, and he built this restaurant, La Rue. Uh, but for whatever reason, his interest in it flagged quickly, and the place uh, uh, failed. It didn't do very well. Well, the, the Sands picked, that pro picked up that property, and actually, I believe a piece of La Rue building was part of the original Sands. The front man for the Sands was a man named Jake Friedman. But organized crime figures such as Meyer Lansky, Doc Stature, and Ed Levinson were involved in the background. Uh, but the man who made the Sands really successful was entertainment director Jack Entrotter. And we talked about him at a recent program. And uh, he was able to bring in the best entertainers by far, including Frank Sinatra and, the, and those folks. And that's what really the Sands became known for. Next up was the Riviera, opened in 1955. Liberace cut the ribbon for the grand opening, and he was the Riviera's first uh, uh, headliner. And famously, he earned $50,000 per week to perform uh, there. I'm not sure many entertainers are getting that today to perform, 50, you know, maybe the big, big ones, but I mean, that's a ton of money in 1955. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps, uh, the Riviera went bankrupt after three months in operation, uh, but, but then the Chicago outfit uh, stepped in. They hired Gus Greenbaum, who Mike pictured earlier. He had been at the Flamingo uh, to run the place, and, and Greenbaum was a good casino operator. He made it a success, uh, although uh, things didn't end very well for, for Gus. If you know that story, he ended up uh, sort of in the similar boat uh, to Bugsy Siegel uh, with the sadder note part that his wife was taken away with him. So uh, it didn't end well for Gus Greenbaum, but the Riviera, he, he really made it uh, successful. So he gets credit uh, for that, for sure. The Dunes Hotel opened also in 1955. It was not successful right away either. 1955, frankly, was a tough year for Las Vegas as several resorts opened that year and overloaded the market. The Moulin Rouge was among them as well. Remember, it only was open for six months and it closed. Uh, but this proved to be a temporary situation, as you all know. Major Riddle more or less saved the dunes. Uh, he, interestingly, Riddle did not start in the casino business. He made his fortune in oil uh, and gas and trucking in the Midwest and the South. But he was also involved with illegal gambling clubs in the Midwest before he came to Las Vegas and took over the failing dunes. Interesting side note, Major Riddle was romantically linked to uh, Virginia Hill in 1935. This would have been before Bugsy Siegel probably knew her. They met at the Plantation Club, an illegal casino in northern Indiana that Riddle partly owned. And he was reportedly was a front man for the real owners of that, of that Plantation Casino, which again was a Chicago outfit. Lots to, we could do whole programs on Major Riddle, real, real character. Tropicana opens on April 4th, 1957. Another beautiful place on the Strip with a mob connection. Not long after the Tropicana opened, on May 2nd, 1957, a young mobster named uh, Vincent Gigante took a shot at Costello. Costello survived. This was in New York. Uh, but there was a side effect, a piece of paper. There was a piece of paper in Frank Costello's jacket pocket, and the police found it. And these numbers and words and numbers on this uh, revealed the skim at the Tropicana, the money that was being skimmed by the mob and who was going to get what, uh, and also revealed the hidden mob ownership of the Tropicana. Ultimately, uh, Phil Castell, uh, dandy Phil Castell, the New Orleans uh, uh, gambling operator, he was forced to sell out. And I want to get a nod from Mike. You made reference to J. Cal Housel's earlier. I it was J. Cal Housel's junior right? It was still senior. J. Cal Housel Sr. took over the Tropicana at that point. And, uh, and so what goes around comes around. People involved as early as the 30s are now, you know, still involved in the late 50s. The Stardust opens on July 2nd, 1958. It had a storied history, but its origins are interesting too. That's what I want to focus on uh, today. Here's our guy again. The Stardust was the brainchild of Tony Cornero, 
Cornero, the famed rum runner. Uh, Mike referenced him as being involved in prohibition. He uh, took boats, big boats, out of Canada. He got Canadian whiskey, he brought it down the coast. He would park off a couple miles out from the beach, and then he had speed boats. And he would take all this liquor and put it in the speed boats and then ram go as fast as he could to these remote sections of California where he would drop it off. He was a, a, a volume dealer in, during Prohibition in California until, of course, he got caught. <laughs> um, and then later he got involved with gambling ships, as we know. Um, so he starts working on the Stardust in 1954 with plans to open it the following year. It would have been 1955, this you know, terrible year for opening casinos. What if he had been able to open two? Oh, my goodness. But Nevada would not give him a gaming license. You know, he had this history. And uh, so the Stardust sat idle until 1957 when Jake the Barber Factor, uh, who was associated with the Chicago outfit, uh, received court approval to take over the Stardust. But interestingly, the, the, the gaming control board is like, we can have Tony Carnero anywhere near a gaming license. But three years later, oh, Jake the Barber Factor, come right in. No problem. Kind of interesting how this worked. Um, a year later, Mo Dalitz, uh, his Cleveland group, partners with Factor. And so now you've got this interesting situation where the Cleveland and Chicago uh, syndicates are working together on a casino. And the Stardust obviously was a tremendously successful uh, operation. Now I want to wrap up, uh, we're just getting in, you know, to the end, late 50s here, with the Las Vegas Convention Center. Um, you know, this is another forward-looking project by Las Vegas. Uh, they broke ground in 1957, and the convention center debuted in April of 1959. You know, Las Vegas had hosted plenty of conferences and conventions before. In fact, in reading the newspapers from 1940, as early as 1940, you find groups of, you know, like civic groups and so forth, gathering in Las Vegas for their annual conventions, conferences. But this was a recognition that Las Vegas needed much bigger facilities to accom accommodate much bigger conventions. And, and so, you know, we, we understood that we needed to continue to expand what we were doing in Las Vegas and what we could offer, and we recognized that conventions were going to become a big part of our business. And obviously that, in fact, uh, did happen. So uh, I think if you look in, in every decade in Las Vegas history, you'll see something like this, some kind of significant forward-looking thing that happened. Now, we, we fail on other things uh, all the time, but when it comes to the casino industry, we seem to be pretty uh, prescient about what needs to be done moving forward, and, and these are a couple of examples from those early decades. So I'll, I'll wrap it up right there, and then we'll take some questions. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll, I'll stay here, and then Mike can just sit, stand next to me, and uh, we'll, we'll take your questions if you have any at all. Go ahead and raise your hand if you have one. Yes, sir. I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Sure. Do you think the uh, floor of this presentation is very crowded for the public? And can you comment on what you think? Well, thank you. We appreciate that very much. And you got a round. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you, you want to talk about? Democracy was defined a little differently, obviously. So the black community originally tended to be segregated near here, block 17 uh, across Stewart, and then eventually was segregated across the railroad tracks. And you, you get differing accounts where you will hear that there were cases back, say, in the early 30s where there was a lot less segregation. But by the late 30s, it is really pretty solidly segregated. And then what you see is West Las Vegas develops its own gambling community. Jackson Avenue is where you find all of these clubs. And uh, the last one standing, although I don't think there's anything happening there, was the Town Tavern, yeah. I think. Um, 
If you were a black person in Las Vegas in 1942, you lived in West Las Vegas without running water, uh, without paved streets, and the black population was growing significantly at that point because basic magnesium uh, recruited workers yeah. from two little depressed southern mill towns, although I tend to think that's redundant. <laughs> the, the, the southern mill towns were always depressed. Uh, Tallulah, Louisiana, and Fordyce, Arkansas, and they built a housing development, Carver Park, for the black community that was designed by Paul Revere Williams, who also did the La Concha and the Berkeley Square development in West Las Vegas. So uh, the Saturday Evening Post was not a muckraking publication by any means. Uh, and e even with some of uh, what we are now realizing were Norman Rockwell's more subversive paintings. <laughs> but uh, democracy for them meant you know, white people are treated equally, which tended to be considered true here. But certainly it was not that all men were created equal as far as Las Vegas was concerned. Very good question. Thank you. Go ahead, Jen. Really think. I think we outgrew it. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, outgrew it is a good word. Yeah. You know, it, but but remember, um, really, it it, re, it was reimagined as Old Nevada, out in uh, Red Rock, right? If anybody been to Old Nevada, and then it was, a, and for a period of time, I don't know if you ever went there, it was Old Vegas out in Henderson. Yeah. That was great fun, and those were really modeled, I, I would say, on the Last Frontier Village. And I think some of the Last Frontier Village stuff is at the County Museum too. That okay. trail you yes. walk. And it was, it was a bunch of Western stuff gathered by a guy named Doby Doc Caudill. Caudill. Mm -hmm. And Doby Doc, uh, he used to be in real estate. He sold Adobe houses, so he was the Adobe doctor. <laughs> and uh, he had all of this Old West stuff. And so some of it is at the County Museum, including the train he stole. Because there was an old train on a side, and he saw it there, and he rented a flatbed, took, went up, and he stole the train. You heard of train <laughs> robberies. He literally did. <laughs> but by the way, I, I would want to add to this. We go through phases. You remember when we were a family destination? Now, suddenly Las Vegas was appealing to families. The last frontier village appealed to families. When Kirk Kerkorian opened the International in 1969, they were doing trips for kids to Mount Charleston and Lake Mead. Yeah. They always had something for the family. The question is whether it's advertised. Right. And, and so, but Old West, I mean, I think there was a feeling, yeah, we're, we are now a luxury resort area. I, I'd love to see an Old West hotel now. I'd invest. My, my favorite idea for a, uh, and of course, I, I was pointed out to me this has already happened, but uh, a writer named Kurt Anderson back in the 90s conceived the idea of a Las Vegas-themed Las Vegas resort. <laughs> you know, we have Paris, we have all the... We have uh, all New York, New York. Well, he wanted a Las Vegas-themed uh, resort. But uh, we might have one now with Circa over uh, on uh, Fremont Street. So uh, maybe we, that's actually come to pass. Any other questions? There's one back here. Well, we maybe can both answer that. I, I, it um, was still a two-lane highway uh, well into the 40s. And, um, and, but uh, it was interesting because everything was flatter then, right? There were, the first, anything that was resembling a high-rise was the Riviera in 1955. So before that, everything was pretty streamlined, like motel style, right? Um, and so it was, everything was, everything was car-oriented as well. So you would literally pull into a driveway. You can still do that technically at some casinos. But right off of Las Vegas Boulevard, you could drive to a little highway, a little port cochere entrance, and go park like you would in a neighborhood casino today, where you just park out on the flat surface. Uh, that's how it was. And so, uh, uh, but I don't know, when did it become four lane, six lane? Yeah, I, I'm not sure of the dates, but 
I'm going to bet in the 50s, they probably widened it a bit, but, but especially in the 60s, because it's during the 60s they're building I-15. Yeah. And, and of course, today you can see the old Highway 91 uh, when you're coming in off I-15. Uh, so I think it would have been more in the 60s that you see, see the real expansion of the street. And, and I can remember a guy, must have been about 20 years ago now, who was showing me a plan to put a, uh, a big median in on the strip that would be like Park MGM. And they were, he's, his plan was to narrow the lanes to get people to quit driving on the strip. Because if the <laughs> lanes are narrower, you have to go slower. You have to go slower, you'll quit driving. But now the problem is too many cars. <laughs> Even now! And uh, the only thing that brings to mind is when we first started the pandemic, how many people got a chance to go, when everything was shut down, go out and drive the strip? That was, that was something that was kind of memorable, right? Because you, you would never see that any other time when there's nobody around. That was pretty amazing. Um, all right, uh, maybe time for one more question if you have one. All right, very good. Well, thank you all very much. And, uh, I, I encourage you to come to the next the next one in a couple of weeks if you can, and uh, I think we'll actually have expanded seating for that. So, uh, and with the change in the protocols, so, thank you very much. We're apt to flirt with dollies that are real.